Uh, all right, good evening, everyone, and welcome back uh, to Southeast Seventh-day Adventist Church prayer meeting. The prayer portion has already taken place. Of course, we don't record that, um, but we do uh, record the study portion. And uh, I, I didn't get a chance to say it because y'all were flowing, but I want to just thank God for how he's uh, uh, healing a couple of people. Uh, as you know, Sister Mitchell had surgery on her back not too long ago, and she is doing uh, very well. Uh, and then, um, and then uh, again, I, I mentioned Brother Brown and his birthday the other day, uh, but I, I did mention how he has been uh, in some bad shape a couple of times, but the Lord is blessing. He sounds good and strong. And so uh, I'm sure there are others, but I just want to thank God for what he's done for, for those couple of people. And thank you, our church family, um, those who are physically here with us and those abroad, how much you support myself and sisterhood. We really appreciate that. All right, we're gonna have to get on our bike and run tonight a little bit, but that's okay. This is part two of uh, World War II. Uh, let's uh, uh, the book the Secret Terrorists have a word of prayer, and then uh, I'll be looking for somebody to read for me tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Uh, for your word. We thank you for an awesome prayer time uh, from the sweet hour of prayer into our um, uh, praise and testimony and prayer request service. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for all that is happening. Now bless our learning tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all know the drill. Okay, there's some, there's some, there's some German words in here tonight. <laughs> so if you are prone to stumble, uh, don't jump out there. I don't want you to be all messed up, but I know somebody will just take it and just do the best they can. Who is that tonight? I'll do it for you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Elder Parker. Thank you so much. Chapter 7, World War II, page 76. On March 31st, 1934, the Pact of Rome was signed and pledged support of Mussolini and Hitler for the rebellion. The Holy War broke out. In 1937, in the midst of war, the Vatican gave de jure recognition to the government of Franco, its sword bearer, who was later to be decorated with the Supreme Order of Christ. Mm. Blessed be the guns if the gospel flowers in their wake. Soon the Catholic action was to spread its tyranny, tyranny across the ruined country. Pax Christi, Edmund Paris, the Vatican against Europe, the Wycliffe Press, page 15. All right, let me just pause right here. I just noticed Elder Parker, last week I had two worlds in there and this week I took war out. Hey, hey, man, it's hard writing a book, y'all. Just you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so let's roll on. <laughs> Mito Mussolini was highly esteemed by the Jesuits of Rome. He was the man of providence who restored Vatican City to the papacy in 1929. Mm -hmm. What was happening in Europe between the two massacres in Italy? Secret negotiations took place between papal agents and Mussolini, the man of providence. The priest, Don Sturzo, chief of the Catholic group, had four rights voted to Duce on November 1922. Mm -hmm. Then came the Lateran Treaty to seal the union of fascism and the papacy. The conquest of Ethiopia, blessed by the clergy and on Good Friday, 1939, the aggression against Albania. I bid, page 15. Benito Mussolini was highly esteemed by the Jesuits of Rome. He was their man of providence who restored Vatican City to the papacy in 1929. That's I think on that's page a repeat. Yeah, I think that's a repeat. Uh, okay, go ahead. We might be on track here. Mussolini is making rapid headway and with elemental strength will conquer all in his path. Mussolini is a wonderful man. Do you hear me? A wonderful man. 
the future is his. I oh, did no. page 69. That's hey, the Pope. Bro. Yeah, he really liked him, didn't he? <laughs> yes, he did. A yeah, wonderful man. Like, it sounded like he jumping up and down clapping. I can hear Hercules on this one. Go ahead. <laughs> 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 For today, Rome considers the fascist regime the nearest to its darkness and interest. Wow. We have not merely the Reverend Jesuit Father Kaufman praising Mussolini's Italy as a Christian democracy, but Civilta Catholica, house mm -hmm. organ of the Jesuits, says quite frankly, fascism is the regime that responds most closely to the concepts of the Church of Rome. Mm -hmm. Pierre Van Passin, Days of Our Years, Human Curl, page 465. Fascism okay. closest to Roman's dogma. Well, well, I know there's a lot of funny words in here, but I hope you understand what is happening. And I'll put it in plain English for everybody who's kind of looking on, going, uh, whatever. Um, what Rome is doing is setting up all these people against each other. Mm -hmm. Rome hates them all, especially anything that says Christian or democracy. Uh, they don't like the Jews. They don't like the Christians. They don't like the Italians. They don't like the Spaniards. They don't like the French. They don't like the Germans. They don't like the British and they don't like the Americans. But they are playing nice with all of them because they want to make them destroy each other. Everybody understand what's happening? Amen. All we're doing in this book here, I didn't write the book, but all the, he's doing in the book is showing the proof of that, that he, they were talking nice to everybody. They were, they were stabbed, they were talking, they were two-faced to everybody. That's what he's showing you, okay? Thank you for that explanation. I do appreciate it. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, they two-faced. And all that, that they said, that's all we're saying. <laughs> and I think in Latin it's called Hegelian dialectics. Yes, it is. Yes, indeed. <laughs> we read a previous quote that said that Hitler put it into practice the ruthless principles of the papacy. Now we see that Mussolini did the same thing. It wasn't just the three Axis powers of Europe with their Catholic puppets that did Rome's bidding during World War II. Franklin Roosevelt, president of the United States, also carried out Rome's wishes. There you okay, go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let that sit there for a minute <laughs> and let it digest. You know how y'all always hear me say that uh, Republicans and Democrats are two sides of the same coin. It played out no bigger than in World War II. Vietnam was close, but nothing like World War II. Uh, let me give you some examples. Joe Kennedy uh uh was uh pivotal in getting bank money to Hitler. Joe Kennedy is the father of uh John F. Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy, but that ain't over. That's the Democratic side, right? But on the Republican side, Prescott Bush was instrumental in getting money to Hitler. And this is when he was building up his war machine. They mm -hmm. were putting all their all their influence behind Hitler because they were great supporters of his idea. And why were they so supportive of his ideas? Because he got it from America. He got it from eugenics. That's where he got it from Darwinism and eugenics. Amen. With the same basic thing, which is there's a superior race and everybody else needs to either serve them or die which greatly aligns with, this is what the Pope been talking about in these pages, Elder Parker been reading. They've been saying it in fancy words, but the eugenics idea greatly aligns with the Catholic idea, uh, which is the same as the Inquisition, but in a different way. And the original Inquisition, uh, they just came right out in everybody's face, door to door, convert or die, right? But in this way, they're hiding their hand. They're doing it cloak and dagger by playing all these people against each other. And sad to say, America was not exempt. So look at what happened. In World War I, the, the reparations broke Germany. They didn't have no cash. So how do you get a new Fuhrer and a, and a, and a war machine? That's expensive, right? Uh, well, 
to be the long and short of it is through Swiss banks, we paid for it. <laughs> through both Democrats and Republicans. And who are they? Just representatives of bankers. That's all they were. Representatives of the Rothschilds and or the JP Morgans and the Chase and all of them, they're never going to show their face. They use those people. Okay, so we're yeah. going to talk about that in just a second. And uh, here, here's the guy. Now we're going to talk about who they used to do it. All right, go ahead. All right. And also, they did that helping out Germany, plus the companies that they own made money from it also. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cardinal Spellman was offered an unprecedented opportunity by Roosevelt that would necessitate leaving his archdiocese for months on end. The astounding proposal Roosevelt put forth was that Spellman act as a clandestine agent for him in the four corners of the world. It would be the archbishop's job to contact chiefs of state in the Middle East, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one thing I forgot to say is this situation here with putting, because what they were doing by giving Hitler money was buying stock. Okay. Uh, this situation gave both the Kennedys and the Bushes their fortune. Amen. This is how they became rich. Because because Joe Kennedy wasn't nothing but a dreamer hanging around with mob guys. That's right. Okay? And and uh, and well, we Bush they was you know they was on some devil stuff, but we'll talk about that in Parabellum. All right, let's go. <laughs> well, Kennedy wasn't nothing but a bootlegger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> he would carry on. Right he was carry messages for the president and act as Roosevelt's eyes and ears. The president offered him an opportunity to wield more power than any other American religious figure had ever had. Spellman would move as an equal among the greatest figures on the world political stage. Mm. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, but this is just a preacher, right? Go mm -hmm. ahead. That's all. <laughs> a mm -hmm. few people were certain about what the archbishop did during his far flung travels. His clandestine work raised questions at home about the role of a religious figure involved deeply in governmental affairs. John Cooney, the American Pope, Times Books, page 124 and 125. Okay, I'm gonna shut up after this, okay? <laughs> <laughs> when, it's too hard. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but when, when John Kennedy runs for president as a Catholic, this is the bad taste people had in their mouth. This is why they were asking, are you going to be American president or are you going to be working for the Pope? It's because of this stuff. The, uh, the, the, the unauthorized things that were taking place in the name of, of the American people, but without the knowledge or approval of the American people. Okay. Uh, Elder Hood. Yeah, this is now, see, for me, I'm not the history buff. However, I do think about what we're reading in the context of our current president, who is mm -hmm. a, and you know, he's not just any old Catholic, he is a devout Catholic. And I can remember, and I don't, you know, don't want to, you know, go too far, but I can remember in the beginning of COVID, you know, when, um, you know, he was very new in office and and I think you mentioned it in reference to his uh, his speech was talking about, um, you know, this uh, what what did he call it um, uh, about the earth and or uh, the, the, the earth or whatever this what he wanted to do. But it all centered around Sunday rest of, of the land and, and how pollution and this, that and the other. And when uh, he made it very clear that he is loyal to the Vatican by way of, you know, where he received his counsel. So for me, just reading about our history and where we are in our current history, you know, it is, um, it is, is, is cause for concern when it comes to, you know, uh, 
not really looking at things from a demo, democratic or Republican perspective, but more so of a good versus evil perspective. Um, so yeah, this, this becomes very important to me personally. Well, things repeat because people forget. Amen. I'm gonna add to that. Sister Veronica, go ahead. You know, it's just a question because I was thinking the very same thing that Sister um, Hood had, you know, I was thinking about the president and him being a Christian. But my other question is, is there, you know, so is there a book going to write about this current situation that is going on? You know, like, how oh, I don't know when this book was written, the terrorist, the secret terrorist, but, you know, is there a book going to come out later with all what is going on now? It, 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 it's right here. I'm holding it up. Here it and is. a great reset. Oh, oh okay. Good, yeah. good. Yeah, all of, all of what the plan is, all the way through the 2030s, is in this book. Amen. It came are out you, as soon as COVID came out, which made me suspicious. That's why I got it. How are you, you going to do it? Is that going to be our next book? Uh, no, it's hard to read. Uh, so you got to do that. Well. But, but, but Parabellum puts it all in perspective for you. All right. Thanks. But well, I got to go I'm get that book too then. I have to get that great <laughs> Yeah, it's not easy an easy read, but I have pulled things out of it to tell you exactly what's going on. Okay. All right. So I don't know where we were. Uh, um, we have read that one right there. Okay. Spelman's first allegiance was to Pope Pius XII. And yet, he was used by Franklin Roosevelt as his own personal agent. Mm. Don't, don't they remind you of the CIA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is exactly how the CIA operates. That's why uh, somebody like Elvis Presley had CIA credentials. And he went and asked for it. You know, they, they would use people who always travel. They like people who travel for entertainment or for religious reasons, because they're the perfect spy. Mm -hmm. But my question with this is, if Spellman's first allegiance was to the Pope, then who was using who? Was Roosevelt using him, or was he using Roosevelt? He was using Roosevelt. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Just like our president now, always trying to shake imaginary people's hand. He looking around for somebody to tell him what to do. But see, we got into this mess because of what Elder Parker said earlier. The Hegelian dialectic. This is how it works. It, the first option they give you is so bad, you don't want it. Give me anything but that. But the reason they give you the first one that's so bad is so you don't look closely at the second one. Mm-hmm. It's happened again and again. They first gave you Bush that was dumb as a box of rocks, right? Then when Obama came, he seemed like the next thing to Jesus compared to Bush. <laughs> then they give you Trump, who is, is crazy. He's Archie Bunker reincarnated. So you say, give me anything. So you didn't pay no attention to the current president. That's how it works. Not just here, but all over the world. It works the same way. And it works every time. Because if you get people in their feelings, they stop thinking. And that's exactly what they want. Mm -hmm. Because, see, uh, going back, back to what Sister Elder Hood was saying, make you look at the president. But then we forget about that the Supreme Court has seven Catholics on it. Yeah, and they don't retire. They don't get voted out. That's right. They, they stay <laughs> right there. And then yeah. we forget about the biggest part of Congress and the Senate are Catholic. Speaker of the House is Catholic. And these are devout Catholics. Mm -hmm. And so who do they have loyalty to? They have loyalty to the Pope. I'm going to say this and, and shut up. Remember when Nancy Pelosi was not allowed to take uh, communion because she was for abortion. But they let the president take communion and he was for abortion 
Mm-hmm. So there you go with that Hegelian dialectic again. Mm-hmm. Because both both of them are, are devout Catholics. Both of them have loyalty to the Pope. But mm-hmm. they're trying to make you think that, hey, she, she's, she's for abortion, so we're not going to let her take, take communion. We're going to excommunicate her. But she's still a Catholic, and she's still going to church. And they finally let her take communion. Yeah, and where she just come from? Mm-hmm. Wait, where she just come from this week? She, she just came come from, from uh, starting World War Three. That's where she just came from. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and you got to ask, whose assignment is she really on? But anyway, right. let's get back to this because we started. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Roosevelt and Eisenhower approved of the force. Repro- repatriation. Repatriation. <laughs> repatriation. <laughs> that went out of there. Yeah. And some six million Orthodox Christian people back to Russia. I'm going to read that again. Roosevelt and Eisenhower approved of the fourth repatriation of some six million Orthodox Christian people back to Russia, many of whom were tortured or killed after they reached their destination. Two Russians who have written about this abominable decision by these American leaders are Nikolai Tolstoy and Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Your best guess, guess as good as mine, right? It's on the screen. You just got Solzhenitsyn. to that. <laughs> Solzhenitsyn. And that's a that's a sneeze. I'm just gonna leave it on the screen. So, look, let me ask y'all a question: How many Jews died in the Holocaust? Six million. Mm-hmm. So, so that was horrible. There's museums, there's all this stuff. Why aren't we talking about the six million Christians who got sent to back to Russia, even though they're coming from the opposite side of the Russian soldiers? In other words, you sending me to a place that hate me for where I just came from, what do you think gonna happen to me? They forced them to go. As a matter of fact, Eisenhower, he's good and crazy. He had no problem doing it. And he knew what was going to happen to these people. Think about it. Russia is, a, is an enemy of Germany, right? Yes. So you send 6 million Christians to communist Russia after or doing at the end of the, of the World War II. What do you think is about to happen to them? They're going to get killed. Without a problem. You see how we play these little word games. And I'm not trying to minimize what happened to the Jews. That was wrong. But this was wrong too, right? Amen. Now look at who did it. Roosevelt and Eisenhower. Roosevelt Mm -hmm. was the president. Eisenhower was was the leading general during the war. He became president mm-hmm. so what what does that tell you that tell you that they were following orders that's why eisenhower became the next president who's controlling who that's who? the question <laughs> who's controlling who it's like the last days of ronald reagan where he could couldn't do nothing but eat his applesauce and sleep who was running the presidency it was george bush and when the second right. george bush comes along you know he don't know what he can going on. Who was running it? Dick Cheney. That's the way it works. Same thing with Jimmy Carter, with uh, uh, what's the one that got kicked out? Uh, Ford and uh, what's the one that got kicked out? Nixon. Uh, during that whole time, um, uh, now I can't think of his name right now. The same guy ran it the whole Kissinger. He was really running the country. Amen. Right? Okay, so let's. And he let's was one of the main ones talking about one world order or no oh, he world was order. straight up illuminati yes he was <laughs> and since people were scared of him they're like i don't see no illuminati he's like i'm right here <laughs> okay let's go on i'm having too much fun <laughs> the americans call his repatriation Re- repatriation I, two words I repatriation, word. repatriation. Mm-hmm. operation go kill <laughs> after <laughs> they performed of torture where the prisoner is hauled under the keel of a ship by a rope tied to the prisoner's body to be severely cut by the barnacles on the bottom of the ship. Now that is a shame. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
This is about the time where people throw up our, their hands and say, well, what can we do? Well, the point is you can't go back and change this, but you can recognize it if they start trying to do it over again. And you can tell people don't get on the ship. That's what you can do. But what's the solution, Pastor Hood? When you see it happening again, first, don't you get on the ship and you tell people don't get on the ship. Just like somebody should have told the, the Jews don't get on the trains. You know, Amen. That that gas chamber is not for sanita sanitary pur purposes, like they told them. It was do sanitizing y'all. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's go. These million individuals were not only soldiers who had fought on the side of the Germans against the Russians, but they were women and children as well. Now, oh. now I look, we finna say something now. Now don't y'all get triggered. If people won't name their child Adolf or Hitler because of what happened to 6 million Jews, then why is Roosevelt not a bad name? Amen. Here's, this is a real picture of those people about to get shipped out and sent to Russia because they were of Russian descent even though they were German citizens. Okay, it's time to get your reaction to this. Is this blowing your mind? Is this crazy? You Have you ever heard of this? No, sir. No, I never heard of it, but it's crazy. It is awful. Amen. Not, not crazy, but anything the devil is behind is definitely diabolical. Yeah. Yeah. And see, the thing is, is that when we when we see it in writing, it's abominable. But when we hear about it and watch it on television, they give you a whole different part of what history truly is. They always tell you about the Jews, but they never tell you about the Orthodox Christians, not only Orthodox Christians, but that were German descent, but also all the Poles, all of the Ethiopians, all of these people also that they murdered. When you add it all yeah. up, it's over 12, 14 million people that were killed during that war. I shouldn't say kill, murdered. Murdered, yeah. War. We're not talking about combat. Yeah. We're talking about right. murder. Combat is one thing, and you got to go a little higher because there's another six Amen. million we haven't talked about yet. Amen. I was trying not to get the head. But, <laughs> but see, yeah. that's, that's the, right there. We look, uh, and you see it from this picture. This picture right here should make you sick to the stomach. Look how yeah. the German officer is smiling at and everything like he's so in love with him and now look at the one behind him that is mm -hmm. truly how they felt and these people have no idea what they're about to go into and then think about how a lot of them died being tied to the bottom of a ship and murdered that way not drowned but kill hall yeah just so what they called it tells you how evil they are they knew what they were doing when they called it that amen Yes, they did. We hear about that in, in pirate movies. That's keel hauling. Now you know what it is. Being tied to a ship and let the barnacles rub you, scrape you, torture you to death. It's not a quick death. It's a slow death. Yeah, I, I want and we to... Get up over and over in, 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 in what's the name of that prison over there that Obama let people go? Oh, oh, uh, Guan, Guant, uh, Guantanamo. Yep. We, 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 we talk about the water torture over there and everything. That's nothing compared to what these people went through. I'm through, Pastor. Yeah. Um, and this isn't even the worst story of the night. This is bad, but there's one worse. Amen. Uh, and, uh, it's uh, now I want to make this clear. A lot of these people who got sent back were German soldiers or ex-soldiers. They had no more need of them. 
because they had Russian blood in them. So their wives, their children, uh, you know, I found a couple of actual pictures, other people who got sent back and, and Eisenhower knew they were going to be, they were going to be slaughtered. Okay. Now I've talked a lot of, let me see what's next here. Well, I'll wait, I'll wait. Let's, let's see what we can get done. Page 78. Even though it was Churchill and Roosevelt who made the incredible decision to send millions of anti-communist Russians back to certain death, it was General Dwight Eisenhower who enforced Operation Kill Hall with no apparent pangs of conscience. Ralph Epperson, The Unseen Hand, Publius Press, page 301. Mm, mm, mm. Roosevelt not only used Feldman as his agent, but he carried out the Jesuit goal of annihilating as many Orthodox Christians as possible. The Jesuits sought to destroy the Orthodox Christians of Serbia in World War I, and with this repeat repatriation at the there end of World War II, they destroyed many more than millions of Russian Orthodox Christians. Roosevelt, Eisenhower, and and Churchill mm -hmm. carried out the Jesuit bloody plan with considerable success. Now mm -hmm. you're throwing the Englishmen in there. Oh yeah, they was all a part of it. Jesuit General Count Hawkey von Lodakowski, now see, I can say that one easier than I can say repatriation, <laughs> was disposed <laughs> to organize on the common basis of anti-communism a certain degree of collaboration between the German Secret Service and the Jesuit order. Now, this is mind blowing to me. You understand that the Vatican pledged allegiance or made an agreement with the Nazis. Mm -hmm. and, but they also had influence over England and America. Amen. We're on all sides is what I'm trying to tell you. That's it. That a, a, a con man will make you look one way or think one way and go another. And the Jesuits were very, very good at doing sleight of hand. People would think that they were for something, but they were actually against it. And then they would use people that you would never think would be involved in it. Like my wife just said, she never would have thought Churchill was involved in it. But you have to remember that England was a Catholic nation at that time. So mm -hmm. whose side are they going to be on? Like I said. They're going to be who? on the side of the Vatican. Well, was, who? Like you said. I'm sorry, go ahead. I said, I like you said, they, they were for sale. Whoever mm -hmm. was 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 in need at that time the jesuits had the money from the united states to give money where money was needed england was in the war they needed money so where'd the money come from the federal reserve bank in america that's Sent right the over there to them i like the tie-in so <laughs> amen <laughs> i love the tie they, mm -hmm. they sent all those millions to germany but see they sent money to england they sent money to italy Mussolini was part of it too. They had money in all corners because why? They wanted to make sure everything was covered and that everybody was in bed with them. Well, somebody usually asks, well, how in the world could they get away with such diabolical things without somebody telling? A whole bunch of people told. If you want to find, if you want to get it in a video with the man's face and voice who was there, Smedley Butler, they tried to get him to be in on it. What they tried to do next after all this was recruit General Smedley Butler to then do the resurrection that happened on January 6th last year. They wanted him to take a standing mm -hmm. army to the Capitol and take over the White House under Jesuit orders. And he played <laughs> along with it 
just long enough to get the plan and then he blew the whistle. He came on national TV and told what they had asked him to do. General Smetley Butler, that's one person. And then Eisenhower himself later on realized he was duped. And he, he warned on his, on his speech on the way out of office, he warned against the military industrial complex. He said that was the biggest threat to America. All right, so anyway, let's, this is the hardest one to read, this page right here. So if you get through this one, we'll be about done. Go ahead. <laughs> Von Lodakowski considered the forthcoming bellicose settling of accounts between Russia and Germany as inevitable. And the Balliser Macarickton, March 27, 1942, did not hesitate to write, one of the questions arising from German activity in Russia, which is of supreme importance to the Vatican, is the question of the evangelization of Russia. That's page 79, chapter 7. This is confirmed by Father Duclos himself in a book covered by the imprimatur during the summer of 1941, Hitler appealed to all Christian forces. He authorized Catholic missionaries to go to the new Eastern territory. Mm. Nor has it been forgotten that in France, Cardinal Balder Baudrillard and mm -hmm. Monsignor Mayo de Lupe recruited the LVF for the crusade against Russia. Edmund Paris, the Vatican against Europe, the Wycliffe Press, page 240 and 241. And for those who don't know what LVF stands for, is Liberation Victory Fund another pocketbook of the Vatican. Mm. Yeah, you did better than I would have on that. So here's one more time. I want to show these people being forced um, uh, back to, to Russia. And, um, you know, I need to show these things because America is at a place now where fascism and communism sounds good. Amen. Uh, and what do you mean? We would never do that. Well, every time you promote being totally controlled, well, you think it's totally being taken care of, but it's totally controlled by the government, you're promoting fascism and communism. It is the individual Amen. right to pursue happiness and to seek enterprise and healthy competition and free speech, that's what makes, what has made in the past, this country great. But the shutting down of voices for the sake of trinkets is going down this road that you're looking at on the screen. Because there's always gonna be a casualty of shutting down voices. Even if it's voices that you don't like, they have a right to say whatever they wanna say or think whatever they want to think. You don't have to listen. You don't have to entertain them. Just go somewhere else. You don't have to be on their page, arguing with them, cussing them out. Just go somewhere where people think like you think. But people don't want to do Amen. that. Today. They don't want to do that today. It's not good enough to just say, I don't like what you're saying or what you believe. I want you canceled. And all that is, is just how Nazi Germany began in the first place. That's how communism began in the first place. Let's shut down everybody that we don't like. But there's never an end to it. The end to it is always this, mass murder. Elder Hood. You know, I heard something interesting in reference to what, you're, what you just said. Um, the strategy that is being used in reference to this cancel culture where, where you know, if you say something, then you know, they're looking to take you down. And I heard a conversation is the thought or the strategy behind that is, is eventually by the time our children get to the place of adulthood and having the 
ability to make decisions, to stand up, to fight, to have a voice, they won't have a voice because if they begin to silence the voices now, then by the time they come up, they won't even know the language in, in reference to how to fight the good fight because mm -hmm. you can't call uh, a him a him if he wants to be a her. You, you, you know, it, so, so if the language, if the voice is silenced in reference to how do you speak to these things, they wouldn't know how to, so there wouldn't be a fight in them because they don't know, you know, they lose the ability, the tools, the wherewithal, the know-how. And I thought that that was very interesting yeah. in reference to the strategy. You know, the devil is so funny, the strategy that they're using. So it's not just a matter of, oh, I don't want what, I don't like what you say. No, I'm creating a culture that is submissive and desensitized and don't have a thought, the ability to think and have a, you know, um, what the Bible says, um, that we have to be instant in season and out of season. Well, they won't have anything. Yeah, because... they're deleting words. They're, de they're changing the vocabulary. Yes, yes. And I'm like, wow, God, this, you know, this thing is so much deeper than what the eye, um, you know, what we see in, in reference to how deep, as you, you know, you're talking about, Pastor, how deep and how ahead of where we are now that this thing has already been thought through and is just being executed at this time. Yes, what you're speaking of, a, a British uh, Secret Service agent that was a part of this time, wrote a book about it right after this was over. He wrote it in 1948, he gave himself the pen name, George Orwell, and the book was called 1984. And a great deal of the book was eliminating words so that people didn't know what to say. They was always Amen. in a state of confusion. That's just one part of it. The other part of it was complete surveillance, listening to you, watching you, and controlling everything in your life. All right? So let me let me hold this back up one more time. All that's in here. <laughs> right? They just repackaged it. Go ahead, Elder Parker. Amen. And going along with what uh, Elder Hood just said and what you said, what we have here in America, and I go back again to Hegelian dyslexia. You have the red side talking about Christian nationalism. I don't know if anybody has heard about that. I know you have. Yeah, we talked about it last They're week. They're talking Christian nationalism. Which They're is talking not about Christian, Christian nationalism. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then on the blue side, they're actually talking fascism and communism. Yeah. Because they're saying that we are going to make sure that your, your rights are not trampled upon because they want to change everything. Going back to what Elder Hood was talking about, changing language. There's no longer male or female. Now it's called birthing parents. I'm going to say that again. It's a birthing parent. You cannot call a woman a woman or a man a man because they, they're trying to indoctrinate us into thinking that men can have babies and we know better than that. But that's mm -hmm. the blue side. And the red side saying, we need to take this country back for Christ. We need to make sure the country is Christian, that we can have our constitutional rights. But neither side is right because either side you go on, you are going against Christ. And this picture right here is just showing us what they're going to do to devout Christians who believe the word of God and believe that all of this language that they are changing is wrong and stand on the right to call a man a man and a woman a woman and call everything true to what it is according to the word of God we're going to be in that same crowd right there because yeah, they're going they, to eliminate and, them. Yeah, and these, these people never thought this would have happened. Amen. They never thought this would have happened because they did what the country asked them to do, thinking that the people in charge were going to do the right thing. Well, they had maniacs mm -hmm. in charge. And so this Christian nationalism is not Christianity by the way we define it it is amen 
it is the way that Hitler defined it, which is the problem right. is women need to sit down and shut up. Minorities are sucking up all the resources. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, it, it immigrants are <laughs> our problem. You know, basically, I, I like to be say it nicely by saying it's Archie Bunker, but it is racism is in all its forms. That's what it is. Amen. And, it, and it triggers people who don't have anything. Well, at least I'm white. That's what it does. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's why they come with guns a toting and flags a waving because they're triggered by it. They, they can now blame someone for their condition other than themselves, which is exactly what the blue side is doing. They're saying that the government is supposed to take care of you. You shouldn't have to do anything. They should just do everything for you. That's, that's demonic as well, because the Bible speaks directly against that. And while you Amen. shut people down, sooner or later, they're going to get to you. You think it's fun to shut everybody else down? It's just a matter of time before they get to you. All right, we got some hands here, Elder. Uh, Sister Whitlock, go ahead. Hi, I just have a question. As we look at these people and we're aware that God knew mm -hmm. that this was going to happen all along, I thought about in Revelations where it says, talks about these people in white robes, a number that no man could number. So it has to be way over the trillions if it's a number that no man can number. Do you think that's who these people are? People that Satan has gotten into other people and had them killed brutally. Do you think this is the number? This is a question that no man can number the ones that God has saved, they might've been murdered in this world, but do you think these are the people that died trying to be Christians and God gave them robes and that they're the ones that's in Revelation? Cause I know, well, anyway, it's a large number of people. I just want your opinion. Well, it's, hard for me to say because I don't didn't know them but I imagine I mean I, I I got some books from people of that time uh like Bonhoeffer uh and all those guys uh who who stood in their Christian values all the way to death and they end up being killed uh in Germany for taking a stand uh I definitely agree with that that those people will be in that number and uh, only God knows but I'm pretty sure a lot of them will be because they were victims of circumstance. They okay. were just pawns in somebody else's game. Okay, that's what I had thought too. And all the people who during the dark ages that were Christians, the Huguenots or whoever they were, I just feel that's why this number, no man can number it because man has been so inhumane to other men and all yeah. these people are dying. And, and even though there's nobody to sympathize with them, I believe Jesus does. And yeah. a lot of these people may have white robes. That's just my opinion. Yeah. And, and, and that's part of our blessed hope, right? That is the, that's God's promise that uh, we may not be perfect, but when it's time to stand, consider like Samson, right? Samson has some issues. <laughs> you know, but in the end, the light came on and he says, look, I need to, to go on God's errands, even if it costs me everything. And so where is Samson? He's in the hall of faith in Hebrews. Now that was, that's an unlikely person, right? But God says in the end is the race is not given to the swift or the strong, but the one that endures to the end. In other words, in that moment, in that moment of truth, Whose side will you be on, right? And and so I, I agree with you there, sister. Uh, sister Vita, go ahead. I just wanted to uh, <clears throat> just kind of piggyback on what Elder Visa was saying. It's, it looks like it's been um, a slow walk programming. I remember watching Warner Brothers and I used to find it so funny to see Bugs Bunny um, you know, dressing in drag. Remember that yeah, when yeah. he used to put on the mm -hmm. lipstick and the bra and all of that, and he'd be trying to 
flirt with uh, Elmer Fudd. Like, you know what I mean? We thought it was just funny. But now that, you know, that I see how this just kind of slow walked us mm -hmm. to now they don't even give, you know, a woman the right to be a mother. It's you're a birthing person. You know, <laughs> yeah. I just, it's, and it's so, like she was saying, they're trying to take any form of resistance away, like your voice away, your options to choose. And I've even raised my children to, um, like, do you want chicken or lasagna? Do you want to go out or do you want to come in? Do you want to go to bed at seven or 7.30? Like, I always wanted to give them the power to choose so they would feel a certain type of way when someone took that away from them. So I've kind of been doing my counterculture programming. God gives you your you know, legal right to choose. And if anybody takes that away from you, including the government, they're operating against the will of God for your life. Like I've been doing this since they were babes, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, I'm just on um, like a Joshua kind of Samson. I'm not going out without a fight. I'm not going to be lined up with these people down here in the gray, you know, getting, you know, slow walked over into a cliff and, and burn up and put in a gas chamber. You know, <laughs> now that I know what the enemy is up to, I wouldn't be like Samson. Father, give me the strength to take him out. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. Amen. Lord, I'm not going out like that. You know, <laughs> Jesus is Lord the whole time. You know, <laughs> I Amen. Just, and that's what it takes. Yeah, I don't plan on, I just plan on resisting the devil even until the end and he will flee. I'm going to resist him to the last breath is, is just speaking of scripture, Jesus is Lord, you know, every knee shall bow. It's going to be something where they're just not going to just have me walking into something and just, oh, you know, oh, they're just going to shower you and then put you in a gas chamber. You know what I mean? It's just, I'm, that's just not yeah. my makeup. And I, and I think, and I think I've said it here before, Pastor Hood, like, I think I know why God put me and my personality type and all that in, in the end times, because he knew, oh, I was going to start a resistance, you know? <laughs> he knew I was going to be the one to be like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> this is what they're getting ready to do, or, you know, giving everybody the heads up, no, don't go there, because I just, I can't see myself going anywhere with, you know, the enemy, knowing that I am my knower, knowing that the Holy Spirit within me is telling me no or stop or move or don't go I'm gonna be led by the spirit till I leave here and I'm, I'm like I said I'm claiming it now I'm not gonna be standing around waiting that's right that's what you're supposed to do you're supposed to make these decisions now yes before you get put in these situations hopefully you never get put in it but if you are you've already decided that here's what I'm willing to die for yes sir that's how you that's how you take down tyranny that's how you shut down evil is enough people say, I'm not playing. I, I, I'm going to make it hurt you to mess with me. <laughs> and then that, and if enough people do that, they will stop. But a lot of these people go to these things thinking somebody is going to rescue us and you are the somebody, you know? So uh, and what, in, line with what, in line with what you were saying, in reference to showing you things. I remember Bugs Bunny uh, kissing Elma Foot and all that. Uh, it's to make it familiar. And that's why the Bible talks about familiar spirits. The more familiar something becomes, the less threatened you feel by it. Okay, uh, Brother Mike, go ahead. Yeah, I, was, I got to say what uh, Sister Bealy said about Bugs Bunny. That brought back memories, but I was thinking of the movie... Uh, that I've watched was uh, Last World Order. It's a, only a movie, but yet, you know, we might think of it only as, as only a movie, but after seeing this picture and hearing this, what I thought was crazy, but it's just a fact that it's always been in front of us. We were just never paying attention to it. You know, yeah, they, they don't want to talk about this. The, last, the movie, The Last World Order, it might be fiction, but it's so true. It's mm -hmm. what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to talk about how this got found again because they tried to bury it, but I'm going to talk about it when we get ready to close. Yeah. But thank you, Mike. Appreciate uh, it. Oh, we, man, we already at nine o'clock. Elder Hood, go ahead. Yeah. Just quickly, uh, uh, Minister V got me pumped over here, <laughs> <laughs> but it reminded me of, of those who stormed the Capitol. You know, yeah. though it was not a favorable act, they were standing for what they mm -hmm. believed in, you know, as a community and, you know, for, so, so just feeding into what you're saying as Christians, we, it, it took me back, this conversation that we're having now take, took me back to uh, part of the Sabbath sermon, <laughs> you know, in that, you, you and, and then the parabellum series, you know, if you want peace, you got to prepare, you know, prepare for war. And it's like, what are we willing to really fight for? You know, and I love the idea of, um, you know, when it comes to when, when uh, um, Minister V talked about the children and allowing them the space to make choices now so that they have that sense of, you know, wherewithal that, that is their right, that they have power in their own hands. And so, yeah, we have to begin, um, you know, deciding now, Sister White talks about how we have to have it settled in our hearts, our faith, you know, as to whom we're going to serve. And, and then God tells us, choose this day whom you're going to serve. And then last but not least, um, I have this book, which they turned it into a series, but it was cut short because of COVID um handmaid's right. tale and it is um, if you know it, it's, it's a little heavy at times but yet it remind me of what we're talking about now and i believe that the devil hides in plain sight where he allows us to see exactly what it is that, that his agenda is about it's just a matter of can we see or do we do we understand what we're looking at when we see what we see Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Uh well let's I, I told you I wasn't gonna keep y'all real late tonight. So let's um let's let's go on here a couple of more pages and we'll be done. Page 79, chapter seven. While the Orthodox Christians of Russia were being exterminated by the papacy. There was a similar massacre going on in Yugoslavia. I forgot about mm -hmm. Yugoslavia. Some of the many books that have been written about this atrocity of World War II include Convert or Die. I mean, I'm sorry, Convert or Die by Edmund Paris, The Vatican's Holocaust by Avro Manhattan, and Ravening Wolves by Monica Forel. And that's just like Islam, Convert or Die. Yeah, well, they created Islam. <laughs> Go ahead. Amen. Go ahead. Amen. <laughs> These books all discuss the murder of around one million Orthodox Christians during World War II by the Catholic Eustace. On the cover of Pharaoh's book, we read, mm, mm, mm. this is the record of torture and murder committed in Europe in 1941 through 1943 by an army of Catholic actionists known as the Eustachi, led by monks and priests, and even participated in by nuns. Mm. The victims suffered and died in the cause of liberty and freedom of conscience. And for those who want to know what the Eustachi is, it was called a terrorist organization of right-wing Yugoslavian exiles dedicated to overthrow communism in their homeland. So they entitled them like they were Yugoslavians, but they were Catholic priests, monks, and nuns. Okay, so- the Victims this suffered- and add in the cause of liberty and freedom of conscience. I'm sorry. No, you good. You good. I just thought you were done. Uh, if you go back last week or week before, I, I, I don't remember what week it was. I told y'all 
when I went immediately to Minneapolis after George Floyd got killed, uh, Elder Allen and I were interviewing people in the neighborhood where all this stuff got burned down. And they were telling us bricks, a stack of bricks just showed up in my front yard. Uh, cocktails and and fire starters just came from nowhere and, and they were just ready for the people to use. Y'all remember me saying that? Amen. Okay, so when you look at all these little spinoff groups, Proud Boys, Black Lives Matter, and whatever else you can come up with, you got to see it for what it is. These are people stoking the fire. They're, they're gaslighting people so that they, they're trying to get it started is what they're trying to do. You know, they want it to boil over to where a, a bunch of people uh, end up killing each other for causes that have been manufactured. Now, I know that's controversial, but look at how long ago they've been doing this. Now, if you recall, I spent some time in military intelligence and special forces. Okay, if you didn't know, now you know. These are the <laughs> kind of things you do in foreign countries to overthrow them without going to war with them. You get groups of people in that country to rebel against it. And once it gets started, it's hard to stop. It's like a forest fire. And then you stand back and let everybody wonder how that happened. We have record uh, in Florida, uh, there's the most recent one, of, of uh, these uh, undercover uh, FBI agents who have been caught joining these white supremacist groups, these radical groups, trying to, the, the FBI agents, trying to encourage them to do things, to, to, they tried to get them to kill a truck driver in Florida. Uh, you know, they, they, and in these radical groups are police officers, civil servants of all kind. And you don't know, because when you see them at work, you see them as their job. But behind the scenes, they're doing this other stuff. And a lot of them, let me be honest with you, they just talking trash and blowing off steam. But it is other people, infiltrators that get in there and they try to get them to blow something up. They try to get them to kill somebody. But all of this is nothing new. You're looking at it right here. Document it. One million people ended up dead behind some foolishness. Okay, yeah, let's move on. Amen. Pastor Hood, before, you go, before I go on, there was a, a young guy, probably in his late 20s. He was being interviewed. He had changed his life. And he was a gangbanger in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And they said, they were asking, but how, how, does, how does these gangs get these automatic weapons? And most of them, and most of the gangbangers are teenagers or they have records, they're not, not able to buy them. He said, do you actually think they buy guns? He's, yeah. I'm gonna give you an example. He's out laying in bed one morning. Mm -hmm. And one of my brothers came, and that's what they call each other, banging on the door. Say, hey, wake up, wake up. Man, we gotta get out here and get some of these guns. He said, get some of these guns. He said, yeah, come on. So he said, he jumped up, got dressed, and they went down on the side track by the railroad track, and there was a box car. The lock was broken conveniently. Opened up the door, opened up the door on there, and it was full of automatic weapons and handguns. So how did they show up there? Who put them there? Follow what I'm saying? Yeah, I saw that Just story. Like There's some military here. grade, military grade weapons with the ammunition. It's hard enough to get those weapons. Amen. You and I can't go buy them legally. But to get the ammunition Amen. to go with that weapon, that's not by accident. All right. Uh, thank you for verifying what I saw. Yeah, these I saw it. Things up. These things are set up. That's why they call for gun control. They put things in place to make people believe that they are buying those weapons. You cannot, I can't buy, I only have a record and I'm 71 years old. I, I can't go and buy an automatic weapon. Right. So how can a teenager go and buy an automatic weapon? And you cannot, it's hard to buy an automatic weapon on the street. 
because if you buy an automatic weapon, that's a federal offense if you get caught with it. That's right. See, and, and so that's that, that just going to show you. Well, you just going to show you that these are being set up. Go ahead. <laughs> well, you you didn't start it, some. So let me say this: they responded to that those accounts, and you know what they said that them thugs robbing the trains. Now I want you to think about this. Uh huh. Well, I mean, what did Jesse James? <laughs> how, how in the world can some thugs rob a train today? First of all, it got to stop, <laughs> right? Not only does it That's have to right. stop, you got to know what car to open up and how you gonna get in it, and how do you know what's in it? Amen. So you know, especially if, you, the, if you're carrying yeah. military grade weapons, it's not just gonna be a little padlock. You got to get in the car to begin That's with. That's right. And they're going to be uh, some kind of guards carrying those kind of weapons. So go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, I just going to say what you just said. Yeah. Yeah. To get into the rail yard, you got to get past security. And to get to mm -hmm. a car like that, you got to get past good security. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Page 80, chapter 7. The least we can do is to read the record of the dark ages, but in our own enlightened generation. Yutashi is another name for Catholic action. Monica Farrell, Ravening Wolves, Protestant Publications cover. Mm -hmm. The mass expulsion of force or forced conversion of the Orthodox Christians to Roman Catholicism was on the agenda. All measures aiming at the elimination of serfdom in Croatia was carried out under the slogan enunciated by one of the Croatian ministers. Boy. We shall massacre the first third of the Serbs, expel the second third from the country, and force the final third to accept the Catholic faith, whereby they will be absorbed by the Catholic element. Lazo M. Kostic, Holocaust in the Independent State of Croatia, Liberty, page 18. Yeah, but nobody said anything. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> the papacy was still trying to exterminate Orthodox Christians in Serbia in the late 1990s. The papacy used the United States as their bully in that conflict to bomb Serbia. The real butcher of the Balkans is the Pope and the Catholic Church, not Slodobin Mil Milosevic. They are trying the wrong person for war crimes. Mm -hmm. All right. I think this is where I'm going to stop tonight because uh, people always ask me, how you know all this stuff? Where do you get it from? Yeah, if you don't want to read this guy who wrote this book, you can watch a bunch of C-SPAN interviews where he, uh, speeches where he's on YouTube, on C-SPAN, it's just putting C-SPAN on YouTube, talking about the stuff we talked about tonight. Okay. John Loftus, L-O-F-T-U-S. Uh, you just look him up or look up Unholy Trinity on YouTube. And you will hear him giving the evidence and how he accidentally found where they buried the records deep <laughs> within the vaults of the government to never rise again. And he found them uh, uh, and he had to actually battle them to to uh, be able to put this out here. Uh, and he was one of their guys. He was their historian, the one writing for them. And he ran into this by accident. And what is the unholy trinity? You're looking at it right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Vatican, the Nazis, and the Swiss banks. Now, uh, let me just share the reason I say stop right here, because I want to share, you know, we only got to like 13 million. I want to get you up to the other. Remember, I'm always talking about the Kazarian Jews. After World War II, uh, there's a whole town in Russia, that's over 90% Jew. And they were almost 6 million people. Uh, you remember, Russia took a good beating in World War II. They did. America had to 
had to come rescue them in the Battle of the Bulge, or they'd be speaking Germany, right? Or speaking Amen. German, right? The Battle <laughs> of the Bulge, right? So uh, um, they took the opportunity. They never liked them anyway. So they took the opportunity to massacre that whole town of their own citizens who were Jews. Uh, they started out with about 6 million. In the end, they only had about 500. Mm. But, you know, the way that they wrote this history is all these folks are heroes. And then if we were to go on, because I'm not going to go, because this is depressing to me. I'm not going to do no more World War II tonight. I'm going to JFK. But if we were to go on and finish the rest of this chapter, you know what you would see? You always ask yourself, what is the purpose of bombing two Japanese cities when the war was over? Guess who idea that was? <laughs> they're, playing, they're playing all sides. And I ain't telling you what I think. They documented in this book that we're reading about whose idea Amen. that was. And, and what kind of church is that? So we're not even counting. We're already at 19 million and we haven't even counted the Japanese. We haven't counted what they suffer and they are still suffering from it to this day. And then while we're at it, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the bankers uh, stripped Hawaii of all of their identity and nationality at this same time. They took their farmland, pennies to the dollar, and promised them reparations. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> they promised them, we're going to give you a bunch of land, we're going to set you back up, and they're still waiting right now. And, and in the midst of waiting, they said, well, it, since you have rendered us helpless, well, we can't be independent, can we become a state? And that's how they became a state, that is Hawaii. I mean, it's just too much. It's so much stuff. But it's late, and I think I'm gonna leave it right here. I got I left this up here for the people watching online who need to screenshot it and get this book, or those who are in in the room with us tonight. So, so any other thoughts before we close out tonight? Any questions? Pastor Hood. Yes, sir. We're talking about all all those that they killed how um, the millions that they killed, and that's not even including the casualties of war, the soldiers and all those that got killed. Oh yeah, that's a different number. Yeah. Amen. But remember most of these people involved are Protestants, so it didn't even matter. They were glad to see them kill each other. Uh, and then we haven't talked about what happened to the Jews that will return to uh, Israel? Uh, if you want to know if that was for their good, then ask yourself what has been happening since 1948. The Palestinians and the, and the Hebrew, Israelites have not never stopped killing each other. And the Arab nations have been t attacking every so often they come back and attack Israel. So what was the purpose of doing that? You know, Sister Whitlock. You know, I just have a question because this is very depressing to me. <laughs> yes, that's but why I don't talk about, about it. <laughs> in the book of Daniel and it says, and Christ stands up. And then it talks about in Revelations, God having vengeance against those who have mistreated the Christians over the years and the, um, I read in the great controversy years ago that your bread and water will be sure. And that when there's the mark of the beast and the seal of God and those that are sealed, some of the other angels, cause you know, two thirds of the angels did not go with Satan. They will, in other words, will have extra protection during the time of trouble. Personally, I'm not looking to go through what, maybe I'm wrong, the Nazis did and, and I mean, what the Nazis did to the Jews in World War II 
And I know man has been very hu uh, un you know, unhumane to his brother, you know? Um, but God is aware of what's going on. Are we living in a time of trouble? Is Jesus about to come? I mean, how can, I don't know, but I just don't see this happening to us the, in, 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 in the last days. If we, if we're going to have all these angels and, and, and people are going to be sealed and I understand before their blood was seed for other Christians. But once the sealing is gone, you know, takes place, there won't be any more coming in. You'll either be right or wrong. So what, in, in other words, can you understand where I'm coming from? I'm trying, yes, I, I, to, say, I hear. I'm trying to say, how, do we have faith in how God has told his prophet he's going to bring this to a close, okay? Yes. That's all I want to say. All right, that's a great question. And I'm going to give you a, a real fast. Matthew 24, it is Jesus warning us of how terrible this is going to be. And he didn't say that he was going to save us from it, that he would help us through it. And then he tells us about the, the parable of the virgins, remember? Right. Uh, yeah, they keep the oil in your lamp, keep your lamps trimmed, keep your oil in your lamps. And then Paul tells us to, to be sober. Because Satan is like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may destroy. And then Daniel, uh, the Hebrew boy, said they they didn't get uh, they didn't avoid the fiery furnace. They actually got thrown in it. But leading Jesus up to it, in there with them. Yes, but leading up to it, he did. They didn't get translated to heaven. What they said is, our God will save us. But if he doesn't. <laughs> we still will not bow down to you. So we're not trying to predict events. We're trying to generate an attitude that first of all, we're supposed to wear this world like a loose garment, that we're not supposed to be sitting there go flipping between Fox and CNN, hoping they'll come up with a solution. We already know what the solution is, that Jesus has to cut the day short. That's the solution. Right. Right. But right. but until he cuts them short, we must be prepared. Jesus gave us all of Matthew 24 to tell us to be prepared. And what does be sober mean? It means don't be a fool. Don't pretend like it's not what it is. Open your eyes so that you can be prepared. And what does Jesus say when it starts happening? That we need to retreat. We need to stay out of it. Many of the people we talked about tonight refused to stay out of it. They put their trust in the state and the state betrayed them. That's what happened to most of the people we talked about tonight. And unfortunately, we have a bunch of Christians today, uh, sister, who are more democratic than they are Christian. They're more Republican than they are Christian. Mom. They believe that the state has a solution. That's why we're doing this. Because people have drank the Kool-Aid, they done drunk the wine, they drunk on it. They believe that if we just elect the right person, no, it ain't no electing the right person. The whole system is corrupt. And the right person is Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit. It is the Father. That's the purpose of doing this. Not to scare you, but to get you to be sober to get you to wake up and stop believing that these people are telling you the truth. Amen. Preach on. Amen. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I, you know, I, I do watch the news. I do not look for man to protect me at all, but mm -hmm. I do believe what Jesus said about having angels there, even in the prisons, or if we run to the rocks and mountains, that there will be angels who see that yeah. I, will, I believe that the Lord will never leave us or forsake us. And yes, and, and all throughout time, God has saved some, and he's allowed some to die. Even his disciples, that, many of them died horrible deaths, right? Yeah. Right. And, and some people he preserved. 
Right. That's all his You know, business. and then I'm just going to say this right quick. When no, you get fine. time, can you help, like on the 144,000, I've understood by listening to some Adventist ministers on YouTube that the 144,000 is like the ministers or they're the strong ones. And some of these people, they're going to be the one preaching. And the ones with the white robes are those who, I guess, ever since Abel has been killed by Satan through other people. Because what happened to the Jews? I felt Satan was behind that. He knows what the Jews did. Je Satan knows that Jesus was a Jew, and I think he hates them. And not only that, they wrote most of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, I'm going to get off my soapbox. But, no, you uh, could. You could. But, you know, uh, we're, we're, you can't stay afraid. I think when you're who's Christian, afraid? Me. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Well, you know, when you think about, I read a book as a teenager on the Holocaust. This thing, I read the Scots Burrow Boys. Man's inhumanity to man is terrible in this world. And I'm looking forward to Jesus cutting it short in righteousness. And coming back, okay? Amen. Okay. Amen. I'm going well, to get out. I'm going to have to let everybody go, but I, I, I will say this. My, my uh, motivation is not about me. It ain't even about this generation. It's about our children. Because what, what bothers me is that they are growing up in this fog where there is no absolute truth. Everything is fluid, but they're being set up for the slaughter. And what kind of parent could just watch their kids being set up for the slaughter and say, well, I live my life and Jesus Amen. comes, whatever happens. No, no. Just thinking you may, it may be hard to get me to fight for me, but you better not mess with my children. And, and so uh, I feel a responsibility to inform them. So every bit of information we give them is, is giving them weapons to fight against the enemy. And so there's two parts to it. There's the part where we talk about history, but there's the part where we talk about God's promises. And this book just happened to be about history. Elder Hood, go ahead. <laughs> you know, it reminds me, Mother Whitlock, remind me of uh, Remember Scared Straight. <laughs> when, they, <laughs> when they would take the kids. And sometimes, you know, it may not be a bad thing sometimes for us to be rattled a little bit to draw us closer. And I, and I say it jokingly, but it reminded me of that scare straight. But, you know, I hear what she's saying. And yet, you know, my prayer is, yes, yeah, some of it is can be hard for individuals to hear and, and to digest. And so I think the end of it all is what she said, that we know that, um, you know, we have an ever present help. So though we have to go and I, I mean, and I think it's also apropos because look at the Sabbath school lesson It's talking about the crucible and, you know, we all have a crucible. We're all gonna, you know, he talks about being tried by the fire. Fire doesn't feel good. <laughs> you know, who wants to go through the fire? And yet, um, you know, uh, Jesus is clear that a servant cannot be greater than his Lord. And, you know, we all have to pick up our cross and bear it. And, um, you know, that took Jesus to the grave. And so if a servant can't be greater than his, than his Lord, then for some of us, maybe even on the line, it may cost us our lives. And so like Vita, I want to be able to say, come what may you know, I'm going to be that tree planted by the rivers of water and declare that I shall not be moved. And I believe that in that time, if it should come, that the faith that we have, it, it will sustain us, even if it requires our lives. I just believe that, that, um, you know, look at Stephen when he was being stoned. I mean, he was literally being stoned to death, but look at what he said 
as he was being stoned to death. Can you imagine being hit with 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 stone? I don't know what stones look like back then. Yeah. You know, but he says, Lo, he looked up and and you know, he's like, Lo, this is my God. Lord have mercy. So, you know, for me, that's hoping that that even in persecution, I can still see the glory of God. Wow, that's mind blowing for me. And so, you know, uh, we have nothing to fear. And that's so right. I just um, yeah. All evil needs to prevail is for good men to do nothing. Right. And that's where we are. The church hadn't said nothing about nothing. That's right. and, and that means that we are held captive by our associations. Like I meant what I said. Some of us are more Mason than we are Christian, more Democrat, more Republican, more sorority, more fraternity. All that means more to us than our God who, who is our creator. And so, yeah. Amen. You know, all right, Deacon King, man, you'll be the last comment here. That's Deacon really King, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, can you hear me? Y yes, go ahead. You hear me, Pastor? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I am so amazed at our listening capacity and now you have a clear picture of what I was talking about when I came on and gave my introduction to the fruits of the spirit. Mm -hmm. We are the seeds that are being taken through the germination process in order to produce the sprouts that will braise up and become a vine that will produce the fruit. And we have a generation that's got to teach the younger generation because they know not. And mm -hmm. the sensitivity of it does not even exist. We knew at our age, when we were children, the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, uh, um, the Lord, um, uh, just on and on and on and on. And what I'm saying is now we have a generation of ungodly um, uh, relatives. And when we talk about especially the state of the dead and the second resurrection. And you, were, you heard the testimonies like I did that how many of us even understood that there is a second resurrection and, and what it mm -hmm. contains. So what I'm saying is the education that we have received and in, in what you just shared right before your closing lines is that you're for the generation yet unborn or the babies that are there be, now because they don't have the cuddling and the sensitization to Christ, to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit, they, they're like, it don't exist, it don't matter. So as I make this a journey to go and talk to the, the, the brotherhood, uh, pretty much who is almost like the, 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 the Vatican, and I have to be careful in how I present myself verbiage, verb, verbally, and yet I have to be confident like the three Hebrews that were tossed into the furnace and don't be concerned because it's not about this life, it's about the afterlife. And I'm just really excited that uh, we have what we have and yet I don't want us to hold it in our hands and not give it because it says always be a giver, give, 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 give. And if you get, if you become that, I'm going to get mine, you, your hands are closed and can't nothing else get into your hand. So as we prepare to go to sleep and revive the, the meal that we've been fed and how it's going to nurture us to get up and go be servants of God and carry out Parabellum and uh, Revelations uh, seminar, we are the generation. It's our turn because mm -hmm. all that we got we got to pass it on. We don't want to take it to the to the grave. And 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 like Sister Betty was saying, uh, the state of the dead and the, and the, and the uh, second resurrection, the first resurrection, and when the New Jerusalem come down and settle, we're gonna be looking at our unsaved relatives who thought that they were going to heaven, no matter what they did or how they lived, and we gotta just smile and just be happy that it's not us and enjoy our eternity and the resurrection of, um, of uh, the Garden of Eden. And that's why I'm so excited because being 73 years young, 
never been a sick a day in my life is because I made those decisions way back when that I wasn't going to smoke. I really wasn't going to drink. I wasn't going to do this. I'm going to abstain and, 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 and have as much avoidance of, of, of a hellish sinful life. And back then you were teased for being that way. You were called the square nerd and everything else. Now they're talking about uh, uh, what they call it, bullying. Uh, <laughs> it's just that their sensitivity is so sensitive, they couldn't take what we went through. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be grandparents that nurture our generation of grandchildren so that they believe in God and develop the strength of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and be able to say this far and no further. Get out of here and be gone. Stand up to Satan and 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 tell him get there behind me like our elder brother Jesus did. It's our turn, and somebody has got to lead the parade and see the truth like you were uncovering you and and Pastor who went to the to the um, to the procession and found out about the bricks and about. <laughs> And I thank you. And oh, okay. uh, good night, everybody. And God bless you. And keep me in prayer. Oh, this is my turn. Amen. Amen. I agree with that. Amen. All right, y'all. This is it for tonight. I, I say I ain't going to come nowhere near 10 o'clock, <laughs> but I enjoyed everything tonight. Uh, and, and you as well, Sister Whitlock. I, I, I think that uh, it's good to speak yes. your mind. You don't have to go with the crowd, but this kind of thing isn't for everybody. Everybody mm -hmm. can't handle it. That's the way I treat the master class. I know some people just get to the bottom line. Well, you know, it ain't for you. You know, mm -hmm. maybe you should go and belong in the other class. Just find one that works for you. But this is the resistance. Movita, I mean, uh, uh, Vita that named it tonight. It's the resistance. <laughs> so, you know, you know, some, of, you know. some of us is from the south side of the kingdom. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I'm serious. They walk over, but they limping back. Man, I ain't going over like that. No, no. The devil this is, is David, right. little band of renegades. That's right. Go ahead, Sister Whitlock. Go you, ahead. Know, I, you know, I'm just, you know, it's not that I don't. I mean, you know, like what your name just said, he sent me for next month. I'll be 87. Okay. Amen. I'll, I'll be 87 years old. I've been hearing this message. I got it from my mother. I given it to my children was preaching to one of my granddaughters today. This isn't new for me. Okay. And there are things that I have read in my Bible and the spirit of prophecy and I'm holding fast to it, that Jesus is, he's led me all this way. I've been through a whole lot of crucibles. I ain't had, <laughs> no, I ain't looking for it to come. It's gonna come a whole lot of times. And Amen. Jesus has walked through with me. And if there, if, 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 if the plates fall and everything be in the next couple of years, I'm ready, okay? Like, who was that that said, you know, what if Jesus, I, I, every day I'm, I'm looking for Jesus to come. I start with him in the morning, you know, All right. but, but, but because I'm alone and because the, with modern technology, I can see my church members, half of them on here, new people, I don't even know them. But yeah. anyway, <laughs> this is my church, okay? Amen. And I support it, I pray for them. And, and I'm not trying to call, turn cold water on what happened to the people during World War One and World War II. All I'm saying is I gotta I gotta look forward to the future and I trust and believe that God is not gonna put on me more than I can handle because I think he wants to save me more than I want to be saved. And I'm hoping everybody online feels the same way. Jesus wants to save you and I'm gonna leave it alone. He loves Jesus. He loves well, Teach I am impressed. Teach. I am impressed with 87. I'm just overjoyed about that. I I, I pray that uh I make it long. That's a beautiful thing. All right, Sister Parker, maybe you're gonna be the last one. Let's see. 
<laughs> inviting all those that are able to come in to be a part with us on tomorrow morning at seven o'clock as we continue to pray for our upcoming message, the enemy at the wall, at the gate, no, at the wall, praise God, Nehemiah 4, 6, 7, and 8. As our pastor brings forth the message, we're praying that God be with him and that God be with him, that God bless the church doing this and even praying for the uh, upcoming revival and pandemony, pandemonium, parabellum, thank you, Jesus, parabellum, <laughs> asking God to be a part, and saints, if you can, we had such a beautiful time on this morning, and the Lord really blessed us, so covering our church, covering our yes. pastor, and covering the word that he's going to be bringing to us, so come and join us once again tomorrow at seven o'clock, the phone number is 717 0818834. Repeating 717-908-1834. And the code is 11 pounds. The code is 11 pounds. And thank you very much, Pastor. Thank you. That's a good way to end. Uh, Sister Hood, put it in the chat. And let me pray before somebody else jump in and we're going to be done. <laughs> Lord, thank you for our study tonight. Thank you for the fire that's on the line tonight. Use it to drive us to our knees to talk to you and, uh, and cause us to stand up and face the world. We thank you in Jesus name. Amen.